Hi everyone, my name is Jen, I'm an author and a book reviewer and one of my favourite things to talk about is the history of fairy tales. In fact, I go into schools to give talks on this topic, into universities and to book festivals as well. I have a playlist on this channel called Fairy Tales with Jen where I sit down to talk about one particular fairy tale, trace its history and dissect it for you. Fairy tales are essentially living, breathing things. Because they were traditionally told via word of mouth, they changed a lot. They Read, they had children and consequently there are different variants of each fairy tale in cultures all around the world and I just find that wonderful. Today I'm going to be talking you through the history of Little Red Riding Hood. I will link the playlist in the description box down below where you can find my talks on other fairy tales. I'm able to make this series because of the generous support of my lovely patrons so if you enjoy my channel and you fancy throwing a dollar in the tip jar I will also link that in the description box down below. So let's talk about the history of Little Red Riding Hood. Whenever I make these videos, I tend to select a few of my favorite different variants from around the world because there are so many different versions of each fairy tale. I could be here for a very long time. So that's what I'm gonna to do today, cherry pick some of my favorites to talk to you about. We're also gonna be focusing on the historical elements, not so much the modern renditions of fairy tales. So I'm not gonna to touch on Anne Sexton, and Callan Duffy, Angela Carter, Roald Dahl. That's a whole other discussion for another time. Though I will mention one modern version when we're discussing the more historical ones today. I'm going to do it in a non-linear fashion because that sounds like a fun thing to do, but I am going to start with the most common, the most famous version of Little Red Riding Hood, which is Charles Perrault's version, which he published in 1697 in France. Charles Perrault published this particular version of Red Riding Hood in 1697 for King Louis XIV as a gift at his court in Versailles. King Louis XIV, the Sun King, used to have these elaborate, ridiculous parties on Saturday nights where he would invite lots of different people. It was rumoured there were 500 different servants who were providing food and games and a lot of naughtiness went on at these parties. Lots of women who came would wear different coloured jewellery to signify whether or not their husbands were at home and yes a lot of communication was encouraged and there were stories that were told to um enable those things, a lot of tongue-in-cheek, funny, saucy story, I can't believe I just said the word saucy, saucy stories were told at these parties and Little Red Riding Hood was one of those. So in Charles Perrault's version of Little Red Riding Hood, little, I'm sorry I'm still laughing at saucy, Little Red Riding Hood, the dutiful daughter, she left her mum's house on her mum's instruction and went to go and visit her grandmother. But on the way, she met a wolf. However, she did not come off the path at the wolf's instruction, which is important when we're talking about different versions of the tale, but she did stop on the path and speak to the wolf. The wolf said, where are you going, little girl? And she said, I'm going to my grandmother's house. So the wolf took a shortcut, got to the grandmother's house before Little Red Riding Hood, ate her grandmother, put on her clothes, and got into her grandmother's bed. So when Little Red Riding Hood arrived, the wolf said, come in, and Little Red Riding Hood came in, and the wolf said, get into bed with me. So Little Red Riding Hood took off all her clothes and got into bed with the wolf. And then the wolf ate her after the customary, what big eyes you have, what big arms you have, etc. And that's the end. There is no saving Little Red Riding Hood, she does not save herself, there is no saving of the grandmother, and there is no man, woodcutter, parent figure who appears to save her either. She gets eaten and that is the end. So I know that I said that saucy tales were told at this party and you may be thinking, Jen, this tale is not very explicit, but let me highlight a few things for you as to why this would be so titillating to the people who came to these parties. Firstly, Little Red Riding Hood took off all her clothes before she got into bed with this wolf. In fact, a couple of years earlier, Charles Perrault had published a different pamphlet which had on the front um, a picture of a young girl who was naked in bed with a wolf on top of her. The slang at the time in France for a woman who had lost her virginity was she had seen the wolf. So it was very clearly understood to be a story about promiscuity, about being cautioned, about losing your virginity with someone that you weren't supposed to be losing your virginity with. In fact, the moral, because they often had morals at the end of the tales, was this. Little girls, 
This seems to say, never stop upon your way, never trust a stranger friend, no one knows how it will end. As you're pretty, so be wise, wolves may lurk in every guise, handsome they may be, and kind, gay or charming, never mind. Now is then, tis simple truth, sweetest tongue has sharpest tooth. I'm not sure this is something that they would take very seriously given all of the debauchery that was going on at these parties, but I'm sure that it delighted them. There's also some amazing wordplay going on here. So in French, Red Riding Hood is wearing a cape or a hood, which is a chaperon. And chaperone shares similar etymology to chaperon. A chaperone is a completely different thing, obviously. It is a person who normally in historical times would accompany a young woman to stop her talking to men that she is not supposed to be talking to. Little Red Riding Hood doesn't have a chaperone, but she does have a chaperone. And because she doesn't have a chaperone, presumably, she gets into bed with this wolf and is completely devoured by him. I said I was gonna make one modern reference here, so let's quickly do that. Let's think of The Handmaid's Tale. So in The Handmaid's Tale, all the handmaids wear cloaks of red, which is a symbol of their fertility because they are the only women who are menstruating and they are not trusted at all. They have to walk everywhere with another handmaid. If they go to the market, for instance, they have to have a chaperone who makes sure that they do not talk to men that they should not be talking to. But if you've read it, you will know that that is not something, not a rule that Offred and her friends often follow. Good for them. If you hadn't already gathered from what I have said here and in other videos, fairy tales at the time when Charles Perrault was writing his down were not for children. They were definitely for adults. If you're thinking, Jen, this doesn't sound like the kind of thing I would read to my kids because there was also an early version of Little Red Riding Hood where she did a striptease, you would be right. They were not for children. They became for children later and that's mainly down to the Brothers Grimm who sanitized fairy tales, who made them more crisp according to their own beliefs and who collected them and published them in many different volumes. I have spoken about their different versions of fairy tales in fairy tale videos before so I won't go into detail here on that but they did publish a version of Little Red Riding Hood in their first edition of their tales which was in 1812-1815 which was called Little Red Cap and they changed the fairy tale from being one about promiscuity to being one about obedience and nuclear family. So in Little Red Cap Little Red Riding Hood is told not to stray from the path by her mother. She is given specific instructions to do what she is told. Along the way to her grandmother's house, she meets a wolf and the wolf talks to her. She says she's going to her grandmother's and the wolf says, wouldn't it be nice if you pick some of these beautiful flowers for your grandmother? So Little Red Riding Hood strays off the path. She goes a different direction. She goes somewhere she's not supposed to go. And she ends up getting a little bit lost picking all of these flowers, which gives the wolf time to get to the grandmother's house, eat the grandmother, get into her clothes and get into her bed. By the time Little Red Riding Hood arrives, she says, you know, the usual, what big eyes you have, etc., etc., And then the wolf eats her. It's at this point that we have a male savior riding in. So a woodcutter comes across the wolf who has fallen asleep because he's so full and the woodcutter realizing what the wolf has done slits open his belly and the grandmother tumbles out and so does Little Redcap. Little Redcap is the person with the ingenuity here and she decides to refill the wolf's stomach with stones which she collects from the ground so that he is all weighted down. And then when he wakes up, he is so heavy and thirsty, he goes towards the well to get a drink, is so heavy, he tumbles in and he drowns. Then there is an add on to this tale to show that Little Red Cap has learnt her lesson. A second wolf comes to the grandmother's house and Little Red Riding Hood does not let him in. In fact, she puts some water on the stove which had been cooking sausages, which lures the wolf up to the roof. He peers in through the chimney, sniffs the sausages and falls in, drowns, is cooked in this stew. So Little Red Cap has learnt her lesson. Essentially, the Grimms here have sandwiched together two tales, which, as I said, happens all the time. So they have a bit of the Charles Perrault version, and then they also have part of another tale, which is also bizarrely in their collection of fairy tales. If you read a whole book of Grimms together, you will notice that there is a lot of repetition. The other tale that has been sandwiched together with the Charles Perrault tale here is The Seven Kids and the Wolf, which is a story about seven kids, not children, goats 
so young goats, who have been left in a house by their mother goat, who has told them not to let anyone in the house while she's away at the market. But a wolf persuades his way into the house and he eats six out of the seven goats. When the mother comes back, the youngest one, who hid inside a clock, comes out and tells her what happened. And the mother goat, because she is so wise, goes out and finds the wolf who's asleep under a tree, cuts open his belly, takes out her children and fills his belly with stones. He then falls into a well and he drowns. So you can see aspects of both those tales sandwiched together in Little Red Cap. The seven kids and the wolf also harks back to Aesop. So if we're looking at where Little Red Riding Hood has come from originally, though we can never know obviously where it originally originally came from because as I said they were spoken via word of mouth, we can go back really far and to some really interesting places and one of those is Aesop's Fables. Aesop was around two and a half thousand years ago and he wrote his book of fables. In that there are quite a few different stories that have wolves in them. There's the wolf and the kid which is about a wolf who wants to eat this young goat who has strayed from the path away from the flock but the kid manages to outsmart the wolf in the end. There is the reverse title of that which is about a wolf who overhears a mother threatening her baby who's crying saying if you don't stop crying I will feed you to the wolf so a wolf waits patiently outside the house waiting to be fed this baby but then later the mother apologizes to the baby and says you know if a wolf ever came near you to eat you I would get your father to kill it and the wolf runs away there's also a story called the wolf in sheep's clothing so a wolf pretending to be a sheep in order to get close to the sheep he's then eaten by a farmer Later, when we get to the Bible, because obviously this is pre-Bible, there's also that reference in there for the devil who is a wolf in sheep's clothing as well. It's a common motif that we see again and again in stories around the world. If we're going to go back in time, this time not as far back as Aesop, but definitely further back than Charles Perrault, let's take a brief stop at Norse mythology and specifically look at the Poetic Edda, which was collected in 1270. This is the Norse Icelandic um, mythological and um, poetic exploration of the Norse gods and their adventures. And we're particularly gonna look at Loki and Thor. And I really wish that they had included this in one of the Marvel films, but they didn't. And one of these days, I will get over it. So in this particular poem, Thrym, who is the Lord of the Ogres or the Giants, has taken Thor's hammer. And we know that Thor does not like this. So Thor goes to him and demands his hammer back. And he says, I will only give it to you if you bring me Freya, who is one of the most beautiful people in all of the land. So Thor goes to Freya and says, you must help me get my hammer back. And she snorts and laughs at him and says, no. Um, so Thor decides, and the people around him decide that he should therefore dress up as Freya and go and trick the ogre and get his hammer back. And Loki decides to join in in this and he dresses up as Freya's handmaid and he goes with Thor, dressed as Freya, to the land of the ogres and giants to try and get Thor's hammer back. And the reason that I am mentioning this is because it's a man in disguise to get what he wants. And also one of the reasons that folklorists believe that Red Riding Hood has been so successful in staying in our um, social consciousness um, is because of the repetition of what big eyes you have, you know, all the better to see you with, what big teeth you have, all the better to eat you with. It's that repetition that causes tension and makes people really pay attention. And there is an exchange like that with Thor dresses Freya when he goes to the land of the giants. So it says, they came together there early in the evening and ale was brought for the giants. He ate one whole ox, ate salmon, all the dainties meant for the women. Sif's husband drank three casks of mead. Then said Thrym, Lord of Ogres, where have you seen brides eating more ravenously? I've never seen any brides with a broader bite, nor any girl drink so much mead. The very shrewd maid, Loki, sat before him. She found an answer to the giant's speech. Freya ate nothing for eight nights, so madly eager was she to come to giant land. He bent under the headdress. He was keen to kiss her. Instead, he sprang back right at the hall. Why are Freya's eyes so terrifying? It seems to me that fire is burning from them. And then Loki said before him, Freya did not sleep for eight nights. So madly eager was she to come to giant land. So we have this exchange. Why are your eyes so bright? Why are you eating so much? And it's because there is a man who is in disguise 
in front of him. And then Thor does deceive them and he gets his hammer back and obviously kills everybody because I, I mean, why not, I suppose? This motif of men changing into other things, being sly to get what they want, appears in fairy tales all around the world, not just Little Red Riding Hood. Another example would be a Kenyan fairy tale, which is called The Man Who Could Transform. And the beginning of this story shares similarities with Jack and the Beanstalk. As I said, fairy tales around the world share similar elements. Folklorists have catalogued that and tabled them, and it's all really fascinating. I'll leave some resources in the description box down below. So in this fairy tale, the man who could transform. It's about a man who is trying to protect him and his brother because their parents have just died. So he takes the only thing that they have in the world, their two cows, and he takes them to a medical man in exchange for not magic beans, but magical powers. The medical man says, I grant you this power to change into something else of your choosing. So they go to the market and the brother turns into a bull and the younger brother sells the bull to a farmer, keeps the money, and then when the brother disguises the bull, gets to the farm, he changes back into a man and he runs back home. And this is a trick that they keep on doing in order to build up their fortune. Wolves are used as symbols of desire gone wrong in fairy tales other than Little Red Riding Hood too. So for instance, a fairy tale that was written down in the 1850s by Franz Xavier von Schwamworth in Bavaria is a fairy tale called The Wolves. And it's about a princess who's trying desperately to have a child with her husband, the prince, but they have so far been unsuccessful. One day she's walking through a village and she sees this peasant woman who's having her three children baptized her triplets. And she's so jealous of this that she flies into a rage and she says to her husband, that woman must have had an affair with other men because it is impossible for one woman to have more than one child at one time without doing that. The husband says, you shouldn't be so jealous of a peasant woman, you know, and you shouldn't be jealous anyway. Look, it's changing you. When she gets back to her palace, she looks at herself in the mirror and she sees that she has taken on wolfish features. Um, her husband then goes away on business and she realizes that she is pregnant and she gives birth to seven wolf children. Because she said to her husband that no woman can have more than one child with one man at any one time, she thinks that if her husband sees these seven children, he's gonna think that she slept with six other men. So she says to a servant, you have to take away my wolf children and abandon them in the woods and just let them get on with life. So the servant goes to do that, but the prince comes back early and he finds the servant with these seven wolf children and he says, what are you doing? And the servant confesses. What I love in fairy tales is when people can carry out ridiculous grudges, um, plan so far ahead for one moment of petty revenge. So what the king does, or the prince does, sorry, is that he brings up his seven wolf children in secret and then on their 18th birthday, he brings them out to his wife, the princess, and says, look what you did. I know your secret. These are our beautiful wolf children. What have you done? Like, what do you think should be the fate of a woman who abandons her children? And she says, I think they should be forced to dance on hot coals until they die. So that's exactly what happens to her. She is forced to dance on hot coals until she died and the wolf children grew up to be very handsome princes. The end. There is a variation of Little Red Riding Hood in Italian called the false grandmother, and it's the same premise where a young girl is told to go and visit her grandmother. But in this version, she has to cross a river, and she says to the river, can I cross you? And he says, yes, if you feed me cake, I mean, I'm with the river, give me cake, I'm yours, great. So she feeds the river some cake, and the river lets her cross. She has to go through a gate and she says to the gate, will you let me through? And he says, yes, if you give me some bread and some oil. So she gives the gate some bread and some oil and she gets to her grandmother's house and the grandmother hoists her up in a basket through her bedroom window, except it's not her grandmother, it's an ogre who has eaten the grandmother. All of the grandmother except the teeth which she's put on the stove to stew and the grandmother's ears which she's frying in a pan. And this version of Little Red Riding Hood says, I'm really hungry can I eat something? And the yoga says, sure, there's some food in the pan. And she starts eating bits of her grandmother and she says, I, I don't like it very much. So she gets into bed with the grandmother and she's like, why are you 
so hairy? Why do you have a tail? Um, and she realizes that it is not her grandmother and is an ogre. So she says, I have to go to the bathroom. And there are lots of different versions of Little Red Riding Hood where she excuses herself to go to the bathroom as a means to escape from a predator, which I think is something that most women have done in life in uncomfortable situations. So she says to the ogre, I need to go to the bathroom. I need to leave. So she says, okay, well, go outside. I'll lower you down in the basket and then I'll bring you back up. So she gets lowered down in the basket and instead of coming back up, she puts a poor goat in the basket and the ogre brings the goat back up to the bedroom and Little Red Riding Hood runs away. The ogre then realizes when she hoists the goat back up that the girl has escaped. So she runs after her and she says to the gate, don't let that girl escape through the gate. And the gate says, but she gave me bread and oil, so I'm gonna let her through. And then the ogre says to the river, don't let her pass. And the river says, but she gave me cake, so I'm going to let her pass. And then the ogre falls into the river and it's swept away. The end. There are versions of Little Red Riding Hood in Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Taiwanese folklore as well. Interestingly, in those stories, it tends to be a tiger or a panther instead of a wolf. And also it tends to be the mother who makes the mistake not the young girl, and I find that particularly interesting. So in Chinese folklore, there is a story called the panther, where a mother says to her young girl, I'm going to visit your grandmother, do not leave the house. So she goes to visit the grandmother, the mother does, but on the way she meets a panther, and the panther says to her, can I please stroke your hair? I would love to stroke your hair. And the mother says, okay, sure. So the panther begins to comb the mother's hair, and she says, ow, that hurts. And the reason that it hurts is because the panther has scalped her and the panther takes her hair and puts it on his head and then he eats the mother and puts on her clothes and goes back to the house where she's left her children and persuades them to let them in and then the children tend to work out that it is not their mother that it is a panther and they manage to save the situation and kill the panther in the end. As I mentioned, hybrid fairy tales pop up all the time. So there is another Chinese fairy tale, which I wanted to mention because I think it's really funny. And also, I'm not really sure what the moral of this story is, because often there is a moral, even if it's really questionable, okay? But this one, I just can't, really don't understand why we're supposed to like these heroines, because, Anyway, let me explain and then you'll see what I mean. This is a fairy tale called The Fox and the Wolf and it has um, similarities with Red Riding Hood, with Hansel and Gretel and with a few other fairy tales as well. So we open with a family, a mother and a father who have seven children, as I've mentioned before, the numbers three and seven are very important in fairy tales and they can't afford to feed their children. So they don't know what to do. They decide in the end that they're going to abandon some of their children in a forest and they say to their children, who wants to come and visit grandma? And uh, that's the lie that they're telling the kids in order to get them into the woods and leave them there. But only the two youngest volunteer and say that they want to go and visit grandma. So the father takes them on his cart and he takes them into the woods. And he says, uh, could you get off? Cause I just need to check something. So they get off the cart and he says, I'll see you at grandma's, I'll race you there. And then he leaves and abandons them in the woods. And these two children, these two girls, don't know what to do. So they're wandering around and then they come across a cave. They enter the cave and the cave is full of gold and jewels and it looks amazing. It also has similarities, I think, with Goldilocks and the three bears because there are also two beds in there. So they climb into these beds and they fall asleep, a little like Goldilocks. And then the owners of this cave come home, Mr. Wolf and Mr. Fox. And they come into the cave and they think, wait, didn't we leave the door closed? And they're like, oh, never mind. We must have left it open. So they sit down by the fire and they say, oh, we should go to bed because it's getting quite late. And one of them says, well, actually, let's not get into bed. The fire is still going. Why don't we sleep in our kettles? So they have these huge kettles that they use for boiling water. So they get into the kettles, which um, don't have water in them, they're empty. So they sleep in this gold and copper kettle next to the fire, all snug and warm. The girls wake up and realize that the wolf and the fox have come home. So in the morning, they push the kettles onto the fire and the wolf and the fox burn to death. But also, what did the wolf and the fox do to these young children? nothing. They just invited themselves into their home and then afterwards, after they've killed them, they steal all their gold and they go and find their father and they go back home and their family say, oh, we're so sorry, we didn't mean to abandon you. It's so great that you now have all this gold. Now we can all eat. Let's forget that we tried to 
kill you. One final one that I will mention before we get onto the true history of Red Riding Hood, I always like delving into the true history of fairy tales because there are often events that could inspire stories and all that speculation is just lots of fun. So the last one I wanted to briefly mention was an Andrew Lang version of Little Red Riding Hood, which is called The True History of Golden Hood. It is included in his red fairy tale book, but it doesn't have anything to do with the colour red, this particular tale, because he has removed red from the tale. And in this version of Little Red Riding Hood, she's not Little Red Riding Hood, she's Little Gold Hood. And she has this cap, which is the colour of the sun. And when the wolf tries to eat her, he eats her cap first. And it is hot like the sun. And it burns in his throat and he tries to get outside to find some water which gives the grandmother time to put him in a sack and then she drowns him. I quite like that version as well. Anyway, let's get on to the true history of Little Red Riding Hood. This is a story of Peter Stump and if you look up Peter in various different historical documents his name varies slightly which is what happens when we look at documents in ye olde times for Peter was born in 1525 which is way before Charles Perrault wrote down his version of Little Red Riding Hood and the title that Peter had not one that he was born with but one that he definitely earned through much violence was the werewolf of Bedburg. Peter seemed to be a decent chap, don't they all? Except he was a widower. I wonder what happened to his wife. And all the locals thought he was great until one day children started to disappear. They were snatched from their homes, blood left behind. Some women were snatched from country paths when they went out on their walk. One day in a field, lots of children were murdered, apart from one girl who was the only person to ever have got away from this violence. And she said that the person who tried to bite her neck could not bite her because she was wearing a high collar or a hood or a cape. Where was this violence coming from, you say? The locals thought that a wolf must be on a rampage. And that was kind of true, except it wasn't a wolf. It was Peter and he was dressed as a wolf, not Peter and the wolf, just Peter the wolf. He said that the devil had come to him when he was 12 years old, had given him this wolf's pelt, and ever since he had felt compelled to abuse people and to kill them and to eat them. In fact, he had also abused his daughter and she had given birth to a young boy, which he had then eaten in the forest. He confessed all of this to the locals, so they tied him to the ground and had flesh removed from 10 different parts of his body, and then they burnt him at the stake. Oh, but don't worry, they didn't just burn him at the stake, they also burnt his mistress and his daughter, because a paper had been written at the time which said that being a werewolf was actually a glamour that was put on men by witches. So really, it wasn't Peter's fault, it was the women around him, because it's always the woman's fault. <laughs> So there we go. Thank you for joining me today for a history of Little Red Riding Hood. I hope you have enjoyed it. If you have and you're not already subscribed, please do subscribe. I also talk about books on this channel too. If you enjoy my channel, as I said, I'm able to make these videos due to the generosity of my patrons. So if you would like to become one of those, that would be very kind. I'll link it down below. But liking, sharing, commenting is also very much appreciated. I hope you're all doing okay. And I will see you for another video very soon. Lots of love. Bye.